Hi class, I'm Dr. Scott Adamson, and today we're gonna to do something really cool. We're gonna look at improper integrals. What makes an integral improper? That's kind of a unfortunate term for what these things are actually, because they're not improper in the fact that they're like something wrong with them. <laughs> what makes an integral improper is something like this, an integral that goes off to infinity. Now, let's back up to what an integral really does. An integral accumulates stuff. That stuff could be, if you think back to the beginning of this course, that stuff could be the area under a curve. Imagine accumulating the area underneath a curve from x equals one till forever. Does the amount of area that gets accumulated converge to a certain value, a certain finite amount, or does that area just get bigger and bigger and bigger and diverge off to infinity? Improper integrals, we could see either one of those cases happen, a convergence, a getting closer and closer and closer to a finite sum of this accumulated area, or we could see a divergence situation where the accumulated area just keeps getting larger and larger and larger. Now in this case, we're gonna start with the, the situation of integrating one over x to a power. That power is going to be, for us initially, a, a, a power, an integer power. P will be an integer. We're going to start with one, and we're going to work our way up. But first, just to get a sense of what's happening, let's go over to Desmos and see what we can see. So we're going to study a particular improper integral, the integral one over x to the p. And to help you get a sense of what's happening with integrals of this form, we're going to create we're going to create an integral function. Imagine the function g of x, whose job it is to sum up the area underneath the curve one over t to the p power. Now, we're gonna sum that up from one to x. So imagine the power of p was one. As this integral function sums up area, that area just keeps getting larger to two, to four, to six, and if we kept zooming out, this integral just keeps accumulating more and more area. Now it's accumulating, the area under this curve, this accumulated area underneath the curve is increasing at a decreasing rate, but this area is just forever accumulating, getting greater and greater and greater. So we would say that this improper integral diverges. Now what if we did one over t squared? Now I hope you can see here that the accumulated area underneath this curve seems to converge to a finite value of, appears to be one. See, if we can zoom out here, and even as our input variable x increases, the accumulated area just seems to level off at around one. Hmm, one over t squared, that integral seems to converge around one. What if p was three? Imagine one over t cubed. Notice here that likewise, we see an accumulated area that just seems to be getting uh, closer and closer and closer to a half. One over t cubed, the accumulated area seems to converge to a half. What about one over t to the fourth? 1 over t to the 4th, it seems that the area converges, the accumulated area converges to a third. And let's just do one more. What about a fifth? It seems that the accumulated area here converges to a quarter. Now let me back this up a little bit. When p was 1, the accumulated area just diverged. It just kept the area, the total sum of all the areas got larger and larger and larger. But when p was 2, converged to 1. When p is 3, converged to a half. When p is 4, converged to a third. When p is 5, converge to a fourth. Let's go back to the whiteboard and see if we can make sense of what we're seeing here on Desmos. So we've seen on Desmos that the integral of 1 over x dx as 
x varies from one to infinity, thus making this integral improper, seemed like the accumulated area underneath this curve just kept getting larger and larger and larger. Well, let's confirm that with uh, you know good old paper pencil work here. Here's how it would look. First of all, notationally, we'd like to communicate what we're doing very clearly. So here's how we do it. First of all, instead of saying the integral from one to infinity, we might say the integral from one to, and you can use some variable here, we'll use t in this case, and then we're gonna say, what happens if t goes off to infinity? Since we're accumulating area out to infinity, we're really talking about a limiting process, an infinite limit. So let's notate that clearly to communicate that t is going off to infinity, and we're gonna integrate one over x dx from one to t as t goes off to infinity. Well, what is the integral of one over x? Now check your work here, but the function you would take the derivative of to get one over x is the natural log function, the natural log of x. Now I'm gonna use just no absolute values here because we are just on one to infinity. We are just on the positive interval here. So we'll just say the natural log of x evaluated from one to t. So by the fundamental theorem of calculus, we will substitute in a t minus substitute in a one. So we'll have the limit as t goes to infinity of the natural log of t minus the natural log of one. Now we keep on working on this. We'll have the limit as t goes off to infinity of the natural log of t, but the natural log of one, the natural log of one is just zero. So this will be zero, natural log of t minus zero is just the natural log of t. So what we end up with is the limit as t goes off to infinity of the natural log of t. Now just engage with me in a little mental exercise here. The natural log of t, as t just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The natural log of a bigger and bigger and bigger number, input variable, is just a bigger and bigger and bigger result. Now it doesn't get bigger very fast, but as you increase the value of t, the natural log of t will always increase. And so we say that this inter uh, integral goes off to infinity, and we say that the original integral diverges. Now, as you saw in Desmos, what happens if we change this exponent? Let's make it a x squared. So what happens if we have one over x squared? Let's work on this. Again, in terms of good communication, we're gonna say limit as t approaches infinity. And instead of integrating from one to infinity, we're gonna integrate from one to t. But of course, t is going off to infinity. Now one over x squared, algebraically speaking, is the same as x to the negative two power. So let's go ahead and make that move just to be clear on our integration strategy here. So we'll have the limit as t goes off to infinity, the integral of x to the minus two. What function did you take the derivative of to get x to the minus two? Well, in the differentiation process, you decrease by one, that exponent, so now we'll increase by one. In the differentiation process, the negative one would have come out front, but notice it's a positive one, which means there must have been a negative here to counteract it. So the negative one times negative one, positive one, decrease the power by one, boom. So our antiderivative is negative x to the minus one. We're gonna evaluate that from one to t. Now I'm gonna make one more move on this because I just think it's more clear to see what's happening if we again rewrite this algebraically as negative one over x. I hope you're okay to say that x to the negative one is equivalent to saying one over x, evaluated of course from one to t. So let's apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. Let's substitute in t minus substitute in a one. So if we substitute in a t, we'll get negative one over t. Now remember, t is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. t is going off to infinity. Minus substitute in a one. Watch your negatives here. This fundamental theorem demands that we subtract, but we're subtracting a negative one over x is now one. So how does this all work out? 
as t gets larger and larger and larger, can you imagine this? One over 10, one one hundredth, one one thousandth, one one millionth, one one billionth, one one trillionth. As t gets bigger and bigger and bigger, this fraction just gets closer and closer to zero. Minus and minus one, plus one. We say that the accumulated area underneath this curve converges to one. Now, on Desmos, we saw exactly that thing happen. We saw that function get closer and closer to 1 as our input variable increased, as we expected. We now just have confirmation. Now, what happens if that exponent is 3? 1 over x cubed. Likewise, let's use good notation here. Let's say t is going off to infinity. Let's integrate from 1 to t. And let's use some algebra here. 1 over x cubed is the same as x to the minus 3. So as we integrate this, what we're thinking about is the function whose derivative is x to the minus 3. Now remember, when we take a derivative, we decrease the power by 1. So now the antiderivative will increase the power by 1. In the differentiation process, the negative 2 comes out front. Notice there is no negative 2 out front, which means there was a negative 1 half to counteract that. Evaluate that from 1 to t. Now, I just think it's more clear, again, if we rewrite this with positive exponents. So we'll say limit as t goes to infinity. And we'll say instead of 1 half x to the minus 2, we'll say negative 1 over 2x squared. I hope you can see the algebraic um, similarity here. x to the minus 2, 1 over x squared are equivalent expressions, so we're all good. Now let's engage in our fundamental theorem of calculus. Substitute in a t for x minus substitute in a 1 for x. And don't forget, t is going off to infinity. Now, substituting a, substituting a t for x gives us 1 over 2t squared minus substitute a 1 in for x. Again, fundamental theorem minus, but then there's also a negative there, so it's minus 1 over 2 times 1 squared. Now, as t gets bigger and bigger and bigger, square it, it's even going to be bigger, double it. As t gets bigger and bigger, this denominator is getting bigger and bigger and bigger really fast. So 1 over a really big number is a very, very small number. This approaches 0. Minus a minus plus 1 half. So with an exponent of 3, we saw 1 half. We saw that in Desmos too. Now let's just do this one more time and see if you can see a pattern. Remember, 1 over x diverge. Not interesting. Well, interesting, but diverge. 1 over x squared converge to a total area of 1. 1 over x cubed converges to an area of 1 half. Let's just see if we can confirm the pattern. 1 over x to the 4th. 1 over x to the 4th. Likewise, our good notation, t is going to infinity. We're now going to integrate from 1 to t. And x to the, uh, 1 over x to the 4th is the same as x to the minus 4th minus power. Let's work on our antiderivative. What did you take the derivative of to get x to the minus 4? Now, when we differentiate, we decrease the power to negative 4. So in the antiderivative, we'll increase the power by 1. Now, when you take the derivative, the negative 3 comes out front. Notice that coefficient is not present. So there must have been a factor to counteract it. A negative 1 third would do that. Evaluate this thing from 1 to t. And as you've seen, we're going to just rewrite this with positive exponents to make the limiting process a little bit more clear. And this would simplify to 1 over 3x cubed. Evaluate it from 1 to t. So let's apply our fundamental theorem of calculus. So we have t going off to infinity. Fundamental theorem of calculus. First, we'll substitute in a t for x, leaving a 1 over 3t cubed. Minus, by the fundamental theorem, a negative, as it is, substitute a 1 in for x. 
Now, as you've seen it, I hope you can see the patterning now as T gets bigger and bigger and bigger, cubing that T gets bigger and bigger and bigger, tripling it. This denominator is getting big really fast, thus making this fraction approach zero as T goes to infinity. Minus a minus, this computes to be just positive one third. And so again, we see that the area underneath this curve conver converges to one third. So when x was, when the, when, sorry, when the power was two, the integral converged to one. When the power was three, converged to one half. When the power was four, converged to one third. Can we uh, generalize? What if we had the integral from one to infinity of one over x to the p? Now I'm talking about just, let me put it here, p greater than one. And let's say p is an integer for now. What we've seen, I hope you've seen it anyway, is that the result is one over one less than p. So this is a nice result that we would that would work for any power of, of x x to the p, but let's confirm that. We're gonna go on to the next video. So thanks for joining us now. Go on to the next video to see a more formal proof of what we've seen here in terms of the patterning. And also please click on the Advantage logo to subscribe to this channel. I'll see you in the next video.